uh, right now. Uh, all attendees uh, have also been muted for the presentation just so that we don't have any background noise. If you would like to ask any questions uh, throughout the presentation, please feel free to enter those into the chat box and we will wait to answer any of those questions until after the presentation. It's your choice whether or not you choose to share a video of yourself. And if you happen to experience any technical difficulties or if you um, happen to drop off audio or any issues that might come up, please uh, send a personal chat to either myself or to Maeve and uh, we will do the best that we can to address those issues as fast as possible. Um, with that said, we are very excited to introduce, you, introduce to you Tom Clack. Uh, Tom is a professor of marine and environmental programs at the University of New England and the vice president and chair of gene conservation at the American Chestnut Foundation's main chapter. Uh, Tom has been a pioneer in chestnut restoration efforts and we are really looking forward to uh, learning more. So with that said, I, I hope that you all enjoy tonight's presentation and I will hand things off to you, Tom. Thanks a lot, Ben and Maeve. Uh, so great to have this chance to um, just uh, talk about what's going on in chestnut restoration. It's a lot of exciting things happening right now. Um, even with the pandemic, we're making tremendous progress. So it's, so it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to have a chance to to um, explain what, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and to bring back this keystone species. I see Dave Probert there, great to see you, Dave. Um, I, and uh, others, I look forward to your comments. Um, we can all, we'll also have a discussion, just an open discussion at the end. I'll try to go just about a half an hour laying out what's going on in the project, and then um, look very much forward to um, your reactions and questions. Okay, so, um, so there's seven things I want to cover here briefly with you on this uh, biotechnology approach to chestnut restoration. Um, just as a preface, I, I'll note that I'm, this is one of, of several different um, ways in which people have been working for decades, really, to try to bring the chestnut tree back. Uh, one that you may be perhaps more familiar with is uh, this idea of the hybrid chestnut that is bred with the Chinese chestnut. I'm not gonna talk about that tonight. We can talk about it maybe during the question and answer period. Um, and I'm gonna talk about one that is happening right now, I think is very exciting um, with, with the idea of um, a transgenic chestnut that I'll, I'll explain um, as we go along. So it's one particular approach that I think is, is a tremendous amount of, of promise. Okay, so the seven things I wanna talk about briefly with you here then in the next half hour. I wanna first just kind of remind us of how important the chestnut tree was in American culture prior to the fungal blight, which um, was detected first in 1904. If we were talking to people in, in 1820 rather than 2020, this would be sort of obvious. Chestnuts were really permeated American culture in so many ways, and I'll give you a sense of that. Um, but in the um, 20th century, the chestnut was attacked by an accidentally imported fungal blight and wiped out uh, up to two, four billion, four billion with a B, chestnut trees were, were killed by the blight. Uh, third thing to mention is a way to uh, rescue the chestnut tree through transgenics. And fourth, um, talk about the idea of capturing the natural uh, genetic diversity of the surviving trees. So we spend a lot of time on that as well. Fifth thing would, would be to talk about some work we do at, at University of New England on in speed breeding to produce pollen um, that has the uh, blood tolerant gene. Sixth thing would be to give you a sense of some of the exciting work that's been done this summer here in Maine and Cape Elizabeth and specifically where we created our first crosses between Maine wild trees and the blight tolerant pollen. And then wrap it up with this crucial moment where the USDA wants comments from people like yourselves as to whether the blight tolerant chestnut tree should be deregulated. So that's where we're going. And again, this is what we'll loop back to. This is where we are at this historic moment. 
the work on the blight tolerant chestnut tree has been going on for, like I said, decades really. But right now, the um, evidence and the science has been amassed to, and this is what um, USDA requires. You can see when a developer has collected enough evidence from a genetically engineered organism um, that it poses no more plant risk than an equivalent non-GE organism, uh, namely the wild chestnut tree, the developer may petition APHIS, that's a branch of USDA, to determine non-regulated status for the GE organism. If the petition is approved, GE organism may they, then be introduced to the United States without any further APHIS regulatory oversight. So that's where we are right now with this uh, project and the science. And it's an open comment period right now. We'll circle back to that with the opportunity of, for everyone to chime in uh, about their, their feelings about the chestnut and bringing it back um, through this biotechnology approach we'll, I'll talk about right now. Okay, so first of all, just a sense of how important the chestnut tree was to the ecology and culture of the eastern forest of the United States. Um, it was sometimes called the redwood of the east for its size. Other trees were really big as well, but the chestnut grew to massive proportions, as you can see in these photos here um, from the late uh, 19th century. Um, it was a, a very large tree that five feet in diameter was common, sometimes up to 12 feet or even bigger in diameter. It's hard to imagine, but that's, that's how big they were. Um, and perhaps up to four billion chestnut trees, often one out of four trees in the forest throughout its range were chestnut trees. So it really uh, pervaded the Eastern forest. It actually came further up into Maine than even this map suggests here about the southern half of, map of Maine, more or less, was chestnut territory. Um, and this is the kind of size that we had in the 19th century and previous, of course, up until this um, unfortunate importation of a fungal blight from Asia. So, um, so just to get a sense of the scale here on the bottom, if you see those people standing around a chestnut tree on their land, a massive giant tree uh, and it was a highly valued wood. So it wasn't only big, um, it grew straight and branch free for 50 feet off the ground, five stories up, think about that. Uh, it's a straight grained wood. It's lighter in weight than oak, but very strong, easily worked with. And it's, was a, it's a rot resistant wood as well because it has a lot of tannins. And that tannin was, you, was the main source of tanning um, leather, again, through the 1900s. Uh, it was used very widely in construction, furniture, furniture, telephone poles, railroad ties, the works. So it was, it was the most important timber tree in the United States um, prior to the blight. Again, we, we don't think about it at all today, but, but that was its, its really central role in um, U.S. culture, U.S. economy. Many farmers, the main source of income on the farm was not all the grains and vegetables and cattle and things, it was chestnuts and chestnut wood. Um, and the, the nuts of the chestnut, which come inside these burrs, these are the protective burrs that the nuts grow up in and then they eventually split open like a chest. Uh, and that's why it's called the chestnut. Um, the nuts inside these burrs are, are year, yearly plentiful. They vary a little bit from year to year, but but you can pretty much count on a chestnut crop. This is the, what we're, the situation we're in, in in right now in the season. Uh, we just gathered um, many hundreds of chestnut burrs uh, last weekend, um, and they're still out there. So this is the time to find chestnut burrs if you know of any wild trees. Um, it, well, it's a nutritious nut. You can actually survive off of chestnuts. And there are examples of people historically that actually lived off of chestnuts um, uh, in the winter. But it's very nutritious, very well-rounded set of um, vitamins and minerals. Um, and it's a consistent food, as I mentioned. So I like this picture here on the right, this drawing, because it kind of makes these various animals look like they are part of the Christmas, uh, the chestnut tree. And, and, and really they are, because the chestnut was such an important source of their food. So all wildlife, has been hurt by the fact that the chestnut has gone 
what we call functionally extinct. It's not entirely extinct off the landscape, thankfully, but it's functionally extinct. It can't play its role in the ecology. It can't play its keystone species role um, that, it, that it used to play. Uh, when we bring back the chestnut, we're going to see a proliferation of wildlife as well, like we can, can hardly imagine right now. Um, and then in the, the chestnuts were gathered in the rural uh, settings and particularly in Appalachian villages where the chestnut was particularly concentrated. Um, it was really the main uh, income source for rural people. Many Appalachian villagers, villages um, were depopulated after the chestnut died because their main source of income was gone. But they could gather up chestnuts by very large quantities this time of year, bring them to the country store, swap them for, for school books and shoes and all kinds of basic things that they would need. Um, and it was really important in that sense. And then sent to big cities like this picture here from, for Baltimore this time of year, maybe a few weeks later. And then they were roasted on an open fire as we, as we know from the saying and from the song. So all of this has been lost to U.S. culture and to U.S. Um, economics. And then in summary then, to this point about the importance of the chestnut, here you have it. It was an important food, it was part of our culture, important wood source, many cabins were made out of, of chestnut. Even today, chestnut is used um, again um, in what we call wormy chestnut to rebuild things today. It's still a highly prized wood because it doesn't rot. Um, and all the wildlife benefited, even fish, because um, insects can grow uh, and proliferate more that would feed trout when they feed off of the leaf detritus of, of chestnuts. And so even you can think about these kind of ecological link linkages extending even to to water bodies. Uh, so, so it's a really important uh, part of our culture economy and ecology that we've lost, keystone species. So we're trying to begin to revive the cultural connections to the American chestnut. So um, last fall, a year ago, I worked with a sweet cream dairy in Bitterford, Maine. And you see these chestnuts here that have been cut in half and we're figuring out ways to, to prepare them and they made a really amazing chestnut ice cream last year. They plan to do it again. Uh, so we need to get them chestnut seeds uh, this, in, in the next few weeks to do it again. So, um, and it's delicious. So uh, these are the kinds of things we wanna reinstill this linkage between uh, um, American culture and the chestnut that has been severed um, because of the blight. Okay, so I think you got a sense of how important the chestnut was um, prior to the blight. Let's look briefly now at how it, um, how it was and it still is killed by the fungal blight. Um, this is what it looked like shortly after the blight was introduced to um, the United States. It's called Crafenetria parasitica. It was first discovered in 1904 in the Bronx. It was probably imported on accidentally by Japanese chestnut trees that were brought in because people wanted smaller versions of chestnut trees that they could grow in their backyard. They love the chestnut, but it's a very tall tree, grows over 100 feet tall, uh, whereas the Japanese chestnut is shorter. The Chinese chestnut also is a shorter tree, so it's more of an orchard tree. And when they brought these in, they also brought in the blight. So here's a picture of what a big chestnut tree could look like just over the sequence of 1909, 1910, 1911, and then in 1912, this tree was dead. So very quickly that the blight can wipe out a very big healthy tree. What happens is the fungal blight uh, enters into uh, any kind of uh, openings in the bark. That's why larger trees are more susceptible to the blight. And then it surrounds the a uh, stem or trunk of a tree and cuts off the circulation between the roots of the chestnut tree and the upper reaches, the branches and the leaves. So it, it severs that relationship. What happens is that the um, fungal blight doesn't kill the roots. And so the tree, as you can see in this picture, sprouts up um, root, root sprouts off of the, uh, off of the roots. Um, as a way to, to react to the fact that the top of the tree is, is dead or dying. But that doesn't make for a tree. 
it ends up an understory uh, survivor. There are a lot of these, but they don't reproduce. Um, so, so that's very much a, a, a shadow of what the chestnut should, should actually be. Um, this is what the fungal plant looks, up, looks like under a microscope. Um, there are still surviving wild chestnut trees around, particularly quite a few in Maine that have not yet succumbed to the blight. There's no trees that are not susceptible to the blight, but they're more spread out in, in Maine and the fungal blight is, is set back a little bit because of the, the harshness of, of Maine winters. It's much more pervasive and wiped out, wipes out um, virtually all trees in, in more southern contexts. So this is a tree in, in, in Reedfield, uh, kind of in central Maine, it's about 80 feet tall. And these are the kinds of trees we're really interested in. So if you know of wild trees, um, please let me know. Uh, ben and Maeve will give you my email and we can uh, interact. But we're looking for trees like that in general to preserve their genetic diversity. And also right now, this time of year, they'd be putting out, some of them will be putting out fertile nuts and we're interested in preserving those uh, for, for the genetic diversity that they, um, that they have. More typically, chestnuts look like these pictures here on the right. Sunken canker here in the middle picture, again, root sprouts, and then often the, the blight will attack where a branch uh, comes off of the stem because there's a weakness um, between the two where they come together. So this is what, this is the fate of the wild chestnut tree here on the right. So we have ghost forests of chestnuts that still today in some places you can see. There's some in New Hampshire that I know of. It's true because they survive even though they're dead, the wood is very rot resistant. Now we've been talking about the fungal blight, Cryphonectra parasitica that kills the chestnut tree, but it's only one of many uh, imported pests and pathogens that we're dealing with. And I think you know about that. Um, here's just a short list of the many different kinds of pests and pathogens that are killing our native species. Um, this is just a minor part of the list, but we know about the, the um, emerald ash borer. We know about the uh, woolly adelgid for the hemlock tree. We know about the, um, the elm, the Dutch elm disease, and the, the uh, butternut attacked by cankers. So when we're trying to rescue the chestnut, we're thinking about all of the native trees that are in serious, serious jeopardy. We've got some major holes in our, in our native forest. Maine is 90% forested, but there's some severe weaknesses in our forest that we need to do something about. So it's a there's a real urgency. And so I work through the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, and when you see, when you look at their mission, I think it's really useful to think about. So the mission of the American Chestnut Foundation is to restore the American chestnut for the betterment, better benefit of the environment, wildlife, and society, but also restore the species and in the process create a template group to restore other tree and plant species. So we're trying to lay the groundwork or create kind of a model so we can um, think about ways, and it's not gonna be the same, same process and the same method for every tree. In some cases, biotech is the answer sometimes, and it's not. But we wanna lay out a way forward so we can rescue the myriad of different native species that are attacked and to deal with the variety of things. The, the brown tail moth you probably are familiar with. In fact, I even, there was even a very significant outbreak of the brown tail moth in the chestnut orchard that um, we've been attending to uh, in the Shoner Reserve near Georgetown. This happened just last year, early in the summer last year. We were able to suppress it, but that's an example of the many different imported pests and pathogens that are causing serious damage to our uh, native uh, species. So we, the point is we need to act. We have a method. I'll talk about what this biotech approach is. And it's time to really take action because our, our trees are, are in jeopardy. Okay, so let's talk about then what this biotech approach is with this idea of, of, of transgenics, the third, third topic. Okay, so it turns out through a work of my colleagues at what we call ESF, which is the Environmental Science and Forestry College, uh, in Syracuse. So none of this, what I'm talking about today, none of this is, is all of my work. It's a very collaborative project. I'm one part of, a, of many dozens of people that are working to bring back the chestnut 
uh, so I can't take too much credit, but it, but it is very collaborative. So what they discovered is there is a gene it's, uh, for an enzyme called oxalate oxidase, and we abbreviated oxo for short, easier to say. Um, that's a very common gene in wild plants, as you see a short list here, like the azalea, many mosses, many fungi, many wild, or any kind of grass that you see outside has this oxo gene. Um, but it's also a very common gene in much of the foods that we eat. So you see this long list of different foods that we eat, from wheat, rice, barley, down the list, bananas, beets, chocolate, peanuts, very common gene. And it's a gene that these plants, whether they're wild ones or domestic plants, use to protect themselves against things like the fungal blight that wipes out the chestnut. Um, and it, they protect themselves from other things, other kinds of fungi as well. But this, um, but this is something that they have within their DNA. So it's a very common thing. That we eat it all the time, but it's not at all present in any of the castanias, the genus. Castania is the genus of the seven different um, species of, of chestnut. Ours is Castania dentata, the American chestnut. So it's common in nature, common in foods, but not present in chestnuts. And that's kind of the key linkage here with this idea of transgenics. This is a big list here. We're not going to look at it. What, it. what I'm trying to illustrate here is that we keep finding more and more plants, whether they're cultivated plants, domesticated plants or wild plants on the left that have that same gene. So an extremely common gene for oxalate oxidase or oxo. Okay, so how does it work? How does the fungal blight um, try to kill the chestnut tree or how does it and how does the chestnut tree protect itself if we insert the oxo or oxalate oxidase gene? I love this cartoon, it really says it all. Okay, so the, so the uh, fungal blight tries to kill the chestnut tree by exuding oxalic, oxalic acid. So it, it tries to kill it through acid, which can kill the, can, uh, the cambium layer of the tree and then surround it, and then it consumes the, the dead material. Um, so that's what it tries to do. It doesn't, it's important to note, it doesn't need to kill the chestnut tree in order to survive and reproduce. It can eat things, that the fungal blight can eat things that are already dead. Um, and so it can survive in that way. And it does survive in many contexts, including in Asia where it comes from, without killing the Chinese chestnut trees or the Japanese chestnut trees. But it left without any defense, it does kill the American chestnut tree. So what happens then is this, this, this ins inserted enzyme, this oxoenzyme, detoxifies the oxalic acid, makes it less acidic, less lethal. And it gives off small amounts of carbon dioxide and hydrogen peroxide. And this is the way we test whether a particular nut actually has the, um, has the gene once, once we've uh, worked to, to insert it and to breed, uh, breed the chestnuts. Okay. So what's amazing about this, this idea of the transgenic chestnut that has this one gene from, from wheat is that it ends up being 99.99% American chestnut. 30,000 genes from the American chestnut. It doesn't lose any of the wild genes, but it has this one gene and it's inserted to, in, in, a, in a clonal form, in a, in a form that's, that's, that's uh, all coming from a particular wild tree from New York called the Ellis tree. So what that means is that once we create the clone, it's really important to breed it with wild trees in order to restore that genetic diversity. Um, that's the other half of the equation for bringing the tree back. What you see in this picture here on the right are the many, some of the many tests that have been done at ESF in Syracuse, I mentioned them before. So these are, um, pure American seedlings here on the left that are, have been subjected to the blight. Um, the blight has been inserted, kills them. These are um, the transgenic chestnuts that have the gene and they're happy and healthy. And these are some control uh, Chinese chestnuts that have also been subjected to blight and they, they also survive. So that's some of the tests that have been done over the years to see that it works. Um, 
So, so the wheat gene is moved, I won't get into this, it's used, moved to, into the chestnut through a naturally occurring bacteria, it's called agrobacterium tumefaciens, um, and that's where you get the term, this idea of horizontal gene transfer or transgenics. Talk, we can talk more about this if you have more questions about how that process works. Okay, so then since the gene has been inserted into the chestnut, one single gene, which gives it blight tolerance, then a whole slew of different kinds of tests have been done at, again, at ESF in Syracuse to measure whether this transgenic chestnut tree is any different than the wild chestnut tree. Again, it's, it's, it's got all the same wild chestnut genes. It's got this one extra gene in order to protect it from the fungal blight. And the evidence that's been submitted to the USDA in that petition um, indicates there is, is no difference. They function the same. The bees like it just the same, and they use the pollen just like they did, the, whether it's the transgenic or it's the wild. All kinds of things done in the mycorrhizae and the soil, again, functioning just the same. The tadpoles like the transgenic chestnut just like they like the wild chestnut. And in fact, one of the remarkable things that uh, has been discovered in doing these tests is, uh, is that tadpoles actually grow a lot faster eating the detritus leaves from chestnuts, whether they're wild ones or whether they're transgenic ones, than they do if they eat the leaves of trees that have really replaced the chestnut in the forest because the chestnut has died back, namely ma uh, maple leaves and beech leaves. So they actually do much better so, so it's an example of the way our forests have been severely impoverished by lacking their keystone species of, of the chestnut. Okay, so that's how that works. Um, let me just briefly turn to uh, the importance of rescuing native genetic diversity in the few remaining wild trees that, that are out there and we continue to search for. And maybe you know more, know some about, uh, know about some of those trees, would love to know where they are. Okay, so every fall we, we gather wild seed, seeds like these here in the hands of uh, one of the local collaborators um, in, in Cape Elizabeth. We gather them in good numbers um, uh, from trees that are still continuing to produce. And what we've been doing for five years now at the University of New England is growing the seeds from wild trees in the UNE greenhouse. And so my students have, have been doing that. And this, these, all these pictures here you see, these are all the offspring of the remaining wild trees. We want their genetic diversity. We want that natural portion that they contribute, the mutations that, na that nature provides. And what we've done, and this is where the, um, the Celt um, Land Trust comes in, we've planted one of these orchards comprised of those wild seedlings, now saplings, out at the Shoner uh, Reserve uh, on the way to Georgetown on uh, Five Islands Road. Um, so there's about 95 saplings in that orchard surrounded by electric fence. Uh, they represent 14 different mother trees. So it's a lot of genetic diversity in a very small place. Um, and they're growing really fast. So this is what they look like a year ago on the left. Here's what they look like now, or just last month, in a five-foot tube, because that's one of the different ways we're experimenting on how to grow the trees quickly and safely. Gives you a sense of the scale. So these trees are really, in general, the chestnut is a very fast-growing tree. And that's important in itself, because that means the chestnut sequesters lots of carbon. Um, and, and so we know we need to pull lots of carbon out of the air. Chestnut is great at that. And because it doesn't rot, once it becomes chestnut carbon in the form of wood, it stays carbon. So it's a really uh, nice contrib contribution to uh, pulling uh, uh, CO2 out of, the, out of the air. We know we need to do that. In this, this Schoner orchard that Kelt has a conservation easement on, so cool to make that connection with you. Um, some of the first trees are beginning already just in their third year or the fourth year. So we planted it in 2017, it's the fourth year, uh, are beginning to have female flowers. So these can be pollinated next year by the, uh, the blight tolerant pollen in order to 
to make that kind of cross between wild trees. This one's from way up north uh, in Ebden, Ebden, Maine. That's way in the center of Maine. And you can see these trees grow really quickly and reach uh, sexual maturity very rapidly if they're well taken care of. Um, so here's another one of these. We have these orchards in 12 different places in, in, in Maine. But what, what's happening in these, these orchards of, of native diversity is the, is the blight. You can't get away from the blight. The fungal blight is everywhere and it's already, try, already beginning to kill. You can see this tree is beginning to die already. Just a, a four-year-old tree. This is the offspring of a tree we found in, in Kennebunk. This is what the blight looks like at the base of that tree. And what we can do to kind of try to save the tree a little bit and make it live a little bit longer is we take some of the soil. Remember the, the blight does not kill the, the, um, the roots of the tree and there's some microbes in the, in the soil that help to protect the tree. So we pack that around the base of the tree. In order to stave off the blight, it won't be a solution, but it's a way to kind of keep the, lot, the tree hopefully alive for another year or two. Okay, so that's really important part of capturing the genetic diversity and, uh, the, and Kelt has helped in that regard by, um, by the orchard there near Georgetown. Okay, now how do we create transgenic pollen in our lab and greenhouse in, at the University of New England? Okay, well, we started with some seedlings that look very, very small. This is in July of 2019. I've got, I uh, was able to obtain 12 uh, diverse um, these are the grandchildren of that clone that was um, where the wheat gene was inserted, as I mentioned before, to so the grandchildren. And, by, and we grew them under high intensity lights. And by December of last year, we were able to produce pollen off of these seedlings. And the pollen is, of course, the male contribution to, to breeding. And so then we've been gathering up the pollen in order to breed wild trees through that method. We have a growth chamber that we use at UNE. So that's one of the ways in which we uh, produce the pollen in very short order because these, these seedlings are, are a year old or less, but we can get them to sexual maturity by high intensity lights. Uh, and here's what the pollen looks like uh, uh, a little bit up close. It's a remarkable thing, chestnut pollen. Um, the, here's a, just a schematic diagram of what the pollen looks like. Um, and these pollen grains are super, super tiny. Um, they're only 15 to 20 micrometers in diameter. And a micrometer is only one ten thousandth of a centimeter. So it's really remarkably small. And that contains all the DNA they need from the male side. It's quite remarkable, the microbiology of a tree that grows to such a massive size never stops to, to uh, impress me. Okay, and this is what these trees look like. Uh, the small seedlings, I should say, that produce pollen under, under high intensity lights in our greenhouse. And this is what the pollen looks like when we gather it up on microscope slides, and then we freeze it, and then we take it to the field like we did this July to pollinate some wild trees. I'll show you that just in a second. We put it into microscope vials and put it in the freezer. And we sent our pollen from UNE all over to six other collaborators uh, throughout the Eastern United States who are working on the same project and they're pollinating wild trees, uh, whether it's in Indiana and Virginia and Vermont, Vermont New, New York State, all these, uh, we're trying to diversify the, um, the combination of wild trees and, and transgenic pollen. And we test the pollen. So we got like a little fertility clinic going on at UNE where we test the pollen under, uh, under a microscope, we look at it, and these are indicating by these little tubes that are sticking out of the pollen grains that indeed we have uh, fertile pollen um, that, that is uh, usable in the field. And the students are involved in that heavily. Okay, the sixth point, we're getting close to the end here, so I wanna open it up to questions just in a couple minutes. Um, so this summer then we had a breakthrough where we did our first crosses between the transgenic pollen and, and Maine wild trees. And this is one of our wild trees that we pollinated in Cape Elizabeth. It's about a 50 foot tall um, uh, chestnut tree. Uh, we pollinated a total of five trees. This is the biggest one of them. We went up in a lift in order to get up there, put these bags on the 
uh, flowers that we pollinated in order to make sure that uh, they were pollinated by us and not by wild um, pollen sources. Um, here's uh, one of our, of our students, uh, Flynn Wilsey, Maeve knows him. In fact, that was the connection uh, to, to bring me to give this presentation. So Flynn's a really good pollinator. That's what he's doing this summer. Uh, here we are again, up in trees, doing our, our controlled pollination. In total, we, we pollinated 1,500 flowers on five different trees and created 20 crosses between wild trees and different diverse pollen sources. We even began to pollinate some of the orchard trees, um, not, in, not in Georgetown, but this one is in Saco, very small trees that already have some flowers and you need to hold up the branches with sticks because the because it gets weighed down. Uh, so we're beginning to do this in our, in our uh, orchards that have the, um, the uh, progeny of, of wild trees. We'll do more of that in the future. And here's some of our first crosses. These, these nuts here are crosses between wild main trees and the transgenic pollen. So it was a great breakthrough. And we had a, a little work day just last Sunday at my house, outdoor, safe outdoor with masks. And here we have then some of our first ever main chestnuts that won't die from the fungal blight. And so this is the stock that can restock, restock the um, main woods, severely restricted by permits at this point, but eventually that's what we wanna do to, to reestablish the chestnut population of, of Maine as it was in the 19th century. And here's what this could look like. Now, this is an example of a wild tree. It's a three-year-old tree. Look at the size of it. It's double the size of these six, six, six foot tall uh, students. So the chestnut, again, can grow very quickly in these tubes. And, um, and so this is what it would look, look like as we have these small openings in the forest, do some sustainable harvesting, and then you replant it with chestnuts that grow really quickly. We'd like to do it with trees that won't die. This is an example of a, of a wild offspring. It doesn't have the gene, but we need to introduce uh, seedlings that have, have the gene to protect them. Okay, so then finally, the last point is this crucial moment in chestnut restoration he uh, history that we're in right now. Right now, the USDA is asking for public comments about the blight tolerant chestnut. What do people think about it? What are their uh, feelings about whether it should be deregulated? Um, and that circles back to this slide I showed you before. It wants to know your opinion. Um, is it a good idea? It's, it's the best way forward as far as I can tell, being knee deep in the science. Um, so these links then are available. Ben and Maeve will, will make those links available to all of you. I ask, we need people that care about the chestnut, that want to see it restored to the woods, to, to chime in, to offer comments. Um, there are people out there, many people out there that don't want anything to do with genetic engineering, that are against it, that are against biotechnology. Um, my question to them is, show me a better way, show me another way that works. There isn't one. Um, this is a, uh, we, we wanna be careful of about biotechnology. We want to use it as one of our tools. Um, but in this particular case, this has uh, been well documented to be a safe way to bring back the keystone species of, of the eastern forest. So you can go to this American Chestnut site and read a bit more about the, what we just talked about. Scroll down that same site. Again, Ben and Mae will provide the linkage. You can read about, you can read the whole petition, two, all 280 pages if you'd like. We can read a uh, executive summary of three pages, which is plenty, the really good summary of what, what the petition is saying. And then uh, the link is provided there for the comment to the USDA. Uh, and we're asking people to comment. The comment period ends October 19th, so we're getting near the end of the 60-day period. And we'd like people to chime in so that, so that the USDA knows that this is something that people want to happen um, and that just support um, deregulation. Okay, so that's all I had to say. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen and then, hi Ben, you're not asleep. That's nice to see. <laughs> and so 
Um, let's please then open it up to uh, discussion and look forward to what you uh, want to talk more about. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, amazing and very important work. Um, we do have some questions that have come in through chat and then a few questions that were submitted uh, through the registrations as well. Uh, some of them might be questions that you already covered, but we'll go ahead and, and address them once again, just to make sure everybody gets the answers that they're looking for. Right. Uh, the first question I, hear, I see here in the chat is, do the tubes stay on the trees through the winter? And if so, how do they keep, uh, how do you keep them standing straight in high winds? In other words, okay. great question. Yes, yeah, so that's those those tubes you saw. Those are from a company called Plantra, Plantra, um, and it's and there. That's yet another uh, collaborator to our project. It's a very um, enthusiastic company that wants to see the chestnut come back and has been helping and supporting the project. Uh, we're also a volunteer organization, and um, we rely on members to support us. Um, but those tubes. Um, the key thing about the tubes is you see they can make the tree grow very quickly and tall and very importantly as you know about the main woods is they protect the bottom five or six feet of the tree from deer browse because one of the challenges of growing chestnuts is the the deer love to eat the leaves and leer and love to eat the stem uh, love to eat, eat the buds and so they keep browsing them down to the point where the tree will will fall uh, run out of resources, so that's why we leave them on. The, those tubes are four inches in diameter, so that tree can grow pretty big before it would fully um, um, fill the tube. So right now we're leaving them on because, the, of course, the buck rub. This is a buck rub season as well, and they would love to rub up against those um, chestnut saplings. Um, so we protect them that way, so we don't have to worry about um, them getting damaged. And then eventually either the larger tree, once it gets to being four inches in diameter, could, could pop that tube. There's a little seam in the, the tube that, can, that would break, or else we could cut it with a little knife to, to open it up uh, for, the, for the tree to have more space. Uh, but yeah, we do leave the, the, leave the tube on. Some of them we've pulled off, so we're experimenting with that. But my current thinking is to, is to leave them on and let the tree grow up inside of them. It's a great question. Uh, and they held, they're hold up because there's a, there's a, a, um, a stake that the, the tube is attached to. So a, a flexible stake that allows the, the sapling to move in the wind and, and gather some, some, uh, some stem diameter over time. Great, thank you. Um, and next question is, do you expect any pushback from anti-GMO individuals? Oh, very much so. So yeah, that's why it's important for people that are um, interested in, in bringing back the tree in this, in this biotech approach to chime in. Um, there is a very active group that are, are against um, genetic engineering of any sh way, shape, or form. When I look at their comments at the USDA website, I often think that they should have read the petition and many of their answers would have been found there. Some of them are worried that um, this is gonna open uh, a Pandora's box or it's gonna be a Trojan horse and you're gonna have all kinds of crazy ideas coming along in the future. Um, trees that grow you know, 100 times faster or whatever. Um, I think just the opposite, the science behind the blight tolerant chestnut is so tight and rigorous that any uh, petitioners that are coming along in the future are going to have to stand up to that level of precision. Um, no fly by night operation is going to be able to pass the scrutiny of the USDA that, that has happened so far in order to get to this stage and getting the petition accepted. So, um, so it's not, uh, uh, it's not something that's going to be released uh, uncontrollably. It's, it's easy to test the tree to see if it has the gene. We do that again at UNE. Another important point is that ev every other tr uh, seed, 50% of the seeds that we produce when we cross the transgenic pollen in the wild tree, 50%, one out of two, uh, is pure American. So a side benefit of this project um, is to actually increase the number of wild um, offspring 
greater than anything, any other method that's out there or, or, or what nature can produce. So we're simultaneously producing a tree that can survive for the first time, but we're also increasing the number of seeds and therefore seedlings that are, um, that are pure American, that are gonna be, that won't inherit the gene. So I love the wild tree as well. Um, it, um, so it's a good thing in that sense. The problem is the wild tree will die of the blight and there's no way around it um, in nature itself. Good question. Others? Thank you, yes. Uh, another question um, around uh, as the climate warms, um, especially in Northern Maine, uh, do you, do you, can you see the American chestnut becoming less habitable for, as the climate warms? I, I think it's that just the opposite will happen. So as, because remember, we're on the northern edge of the chestnut range. Only the southern half of, of Maine is chestnut habitat um, prior to global warming. So you know that the USDA climate zones are shifting northward. Um, and so, so that's going to be continued to happen into the future. We've been testing that idea. We have uh, chestnut orchards all the way up in Fort Kent right now. Um, and I have a collaborator up there at the University of Maine, Fort Kent, who has a couple of orchards. And the trees are doing great. Um, so even as far up in the crown of Maine that you can go, the chestnut is already um, a tree that can survive. And it's only going to be um, habitat that is even more suitable um, in future decades. So what that means is that rather than having Maine on the edge of the um, habitat, the native range as it was historically, Maine is actually going to be right in the heart of the range. This, I didn't mention this, but it's worth noting very briefly that the southern states actually have another fungal problem besides the fungal blight that we talked about tonight. There's a root rot problem that also is another way in which the southern trees are killed. So there are very few chestnut trees at all in the south. Uh, we don't have that root rot problem here yet, but it's creeping northward. Um, and it's in southern Pennsylvania right now. Um, so, so places like Maine, which have only this one problem where we've come up with a solution, are really crucial to the restoration of the chestnut. Great, thank you. We, uh, we also have a few questions that I'll kind of, I'll roll into one because they're, they're around uh, purchasing these trees and if you can purchase them um, and for your own for your own planting in your yard right. that's possible right. good great question and so right now the the wheat gene blight tolerant chestnut that we that i described today that we have at une it's under permit it's under strict permit uh governed by the u.s department of agriculture um so it's not possible for the public to get those trees at this point. That's exactly what that comment uh, period is about, to, to move in the direction of deregulating the wheat, the wheat gene blight uh, tolerant chestnut. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, there's also the EPA that has their say, and there's the Food and Drug Administration, because chestnuts are a food as well. They also have their say. So we're, we're working with those three agencies right now uh, in trying to move the process. It's all sound, seeming very positive. The, the engagement is positive right now. Um, and we want to make the tree available to the public, um, but it's going to be a while before that happens. Um, meanwhile, we want to continue the science. We want to, this next summer, uh, plant uh, the uh, blight tolerant seedlings outdoors in Maine for the first time, subject them to the um, fungal blight, ensure that they survive just as well as they survive in lab settings. So do some field testing. And as soon as um, the, they're available to the public, land organizations like, like CELT would be prime um, groups that we would be interested in working with. And then also um, the, the general public. Um, so we want to move this process forward as quickly as we can. What you can do now, you want to do something to support 
chestnut restoration is you can tell the USDA that you're all in favor of it and tell, tell your own story. You don't have to be a scientist, speak from the heart. They wanna hear people from whatever point of view um, they have individually. Thank you. Uh, another question we have is, how do you know that all of this year's chestnuts contain the 0x0 gene? And yeah. when will the federal agency publish its recommendation regarding the petition? Yeah, great, great question. So, so we have a test that we'll be conducting at UNE over the next uh, couple months, students, of course, deeply involved. Um, so you can, you can subject, uh, what we do is we cut a very tiny piece off of the nut. We know that we can do that because we've experimented in chopping nuts up last fall, or sorry, in the spring, and then we grew them out and they grew just as well as ones that were not um, sampled. So we've established that we can sample a nut without killing it. And then we take that little piece of the nut and we subject it to the oxalic acid um, that the fungal blight uses. And if we find that there's hydrogen peroxide in the test tube, then we know that the, the piece of the, of the nut is protecting itself and therefore it has the gene. If it doesn't produce hydrogen peroxide, then we know it doesn't have the gene. And we know that's just a pure American offspring. Um, so it's a test that can be done at, uh, by the, on the, the nut all the way to the tree in order to test for that gene. Um, the second part of the question was about, what was it exactly? Sorry, uh, Ben, it was a good question. Uh, when will the federal agency publish its When will it happen? Yeah, so this, uh, so this petition process we're in right now, it only lasts until October 19th, and then it's closed. So it's important for people to, to chime in right away, if you would please do that and, and, and play a role. This is how environmental policy gets set. Um, and then there's going to be uh, a, you know, uh, a review by USDA of all the comments and to make a determination. Um, it's on their, on, on their time scale and time frame, so I don't know how long exactly that will take. There's also an environmental impact statement that they do. And again, it's, it's according to their time frame. So, um, so whenever that plays out, we will be uh, ready to continue to move forward, but it's not under our um, our schedule. Uh, another question is how do you get to the nuts before the squirrels do? Yep, that's, that's a challenge and of course the squirrels deserve the nuts because they would always have lived off the nuts as were, did the bear, bears and as did the passenger pigeons, you know, and we, we stole them from them, right? So it's, a, you know, it's just worth noting, you know, why do we have these problems in our forests? Well, oftentimes these are, in most cases, these are pathogens and pests that humans have introduced. Maybe they didn't mean to introduce them, but they did. Um, and so, you know, I think there's, you can say there's a moral obligation to do something to try to reverse the ecological damage. If we can bring back the chestnut tree, the keystone species of the East, we can turn around arguably the biggest ecological disaster that has affected um, the eastern forest and to bring back something that's going to have a tree that's going to have such widespread impacts. Um, so what we do in terms of the seeds that we're interested in is try to get there, if it's just a wild tree, try to get there one step ahead of the squirrels. It's a challenge because they live there and they're keeping an eye on the trees much better than we are. But in the case of the ones that we pollinate with the blight tolerant pollen, you saw a picture of those bags, those paper bags, and in fact, they're even encompassed in mesh bags um, in, the, uh, in the trees so that those squirrels can't eat through them. It's the mesh, the aluminum mesh that protects them until we get up there to, to harvest. So it is, it is messing with our wildlife creatures, but um, I hope they understand that this is something we're doing for the sake of all wildlife. And we'll get them as many chestnuts as we can as soon as possible. By the way, the, 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 the blue jay, I know a lot of people don't like the blue jay because they're loud and kind of aggressive, but the blue jay is the absolute most important partner for chestnut restoration. No animal moves the, moves the chestnuts further than the blue jay. They can move them a kilometer per year. So, um, so I love my blue jay buddies 
and I can't wait to re, uh, release them to spread the chest, uh, blight tolerant chestnuts all over Maine. It's awesome. We uh, another question. Uh, somebody said this is one approach, but can it coexist with the other restoration efforts and strategies? There's still some promise in other efforts. Y yes, it can, and it, yes, it can. And the other, mo the other prominent effort is the breeding of the American chestnut with the Chinese chestnut, because the Chinese chestnut co-evolved in Asia with the fungal blight and has its own mechanisms for protecting itself. It's important to note it's not the same as this oxalate oxidate enzyme that um, we've used to, um, to protect the uh, chestnut tree through the biotech approach. It's a, it's a multiple uh, gene approach in the Chinese tree. And that's, no, that's very typical when you see a co-evolution relationship between a plant and a, a fungus that wants to kill it. The challenge of the, um, the hybrid approach of hybridizing the American and the Chinese is that there are so many genes in the, in the, uh, the 30,000 gene Chinese chestnut that matter. We've identified about nine loci or regions in the Chinese genome that matter. And there's no technology today that can move that many genes from one uh, plant to another. Um, so that's where the, the science is on that particular approach, is the fact that there's a lot more genes that matter uh, in the Chinese that would need to be brought over for to, to bring that kind of uh, protection over to the American chestnut tree. But the science is continuing. That's another aggressive uh, approach being pursued uh, by the American Chestnut Foundation. Great, thank you. Um... We just have a couple more questions in here. Uh, one of them is, what are the best soil conditions for growing chestnuts? And will they grow well on land that supports beech trees as well? Um, yes, they will grow well in beech tree habitat. In fact, the beech is a major replacement tree for the chestnut, where the chestnut died back, the, uh, the, the beech has come in. It's notable, as you probably know, the beech are under serious pathogen jeopardy as well. So it's yet another tree that is growing primarily as an understory tree. It reproduces quite vigorously, but it's overwhelmingly very small, uh, small uh, seedlings and saplings, uh, not the giant beech that is the native uh, tree of the Eastern forest. Um, so, but, but, but those, are, those are the same kinds of soils that, um, that the chestnut would grow in. The chestnut likes a well-drained soil in general. So it likes the ridges. It doesn't like the valley bottoms as much. So um, a clay soil isn't as good. A waterlogged soil is not as good for the chestnut. On the other hand, um, a gravelly soil is actually a, a, a soil that the chestnut can do fine in. So there's been some work done on the former mining lands in places like Eastern Ohio and in West Virginia that are very uh, poor landscapes left over from mining, coal mining, and chestnuts have been planted on those lands and they do fine. And so it can handle uh, uh, soil environments that most uh, trees um, cannot thrive in. Great. Thank you. Um, and the last uh, question or comment that we have in here is just uh, seeing if you've considered collaboration with Pamela Ahrens, who is the author of Understory, uh, to promote awareness and raise funds for your program. Uh, no, I, I'm just about finished reading Overstory, <laughs> Richard Powers' amazing, amazing book. And I imagine quite a few of you have have uh, read some of that. The first chapter of the course is about chestnuts, and so that's what lured people like me in, although every story has got something to do with trees. But I'm not familiar with the book Understory, so I'd like, I'd like to pursue that, um, that uh, connection. So I'm going to look for that book um, and find out whether there is a possibility of collaborating. But we, you know, we, are, we are just like Kelt. We are a volunteer organization. Um, 
to to bring the tree back. And, and the other thing you can do besides writing a comment is become a member. If you're not already a member of the American Chestnut Foundation, that's how we're going to bring the tree back. Awesome. Well, uh, it seems like that's all the questions that we have. Great. Um, but thank you so much, Tom. Um, yeah. And I will be sending a, an email out to all the uh, registrants for tonight with some of the links that you've shared. And we definitely encourage everybody to uh, chime in on this and show their support. Um, and it's just been a, a lot of really awesome information. And I know we really all Thanks so much for this opportunity. Um, please provide my email address if anybody wants to follow up in various ways. That way I'd be happy to, um, to continue the dialogue. Um, and thanks for your awesome work at CELT, really crucial to land protection and to offering opportunities for people. And boy, do they need it to get out in nature these days um, under, under these restrictions. Nothing like a walk in nature on your wonderful trails. To, to lift people's spirits and give them, uh, give them some really healthy outdoors time and uh, space. So thank you for that work. So yeah, it's been great to chat with you. Great questions. Appreciate your organizing, uh, Maeve and Ben. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pass out your email as well and I'll pass along any questions after the presentation as well. Along with the links to the comment period. Thank you. Yes, yes. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. That'll conclude our presentation tonight. Um, we will have another presentation coming up in November on the Holt Research Forest. Um, so uh, please stay tuned, and we'll have some more information on that as well uh, through our email and on social media. But thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And thank you very much, Tom. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you, Tom. Yeah.